Welcome everyone to today's webinar on municipal community collaboration on climate resilience. And as everyone gets settled in, I invite you all to introduce yourselves in the chat by dropping in your name, your organization or affiliation and where you're joining us from, just so we can get to know who's in this virtual room with us today. And I will quickly introduce myself for those who don't know me. I'm Laura Schnur, pronouns are she, her, and I'm the director of Tamarack's Community Climate Transitions Network. I'm joining you all today from Oxford, UK, the land of the colonizers. Though two other places I call home at the moment are Jojage, traditional and unceded territory of the Kahaga people, colonially known as Montreal, and Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory, known as Western Quebec. The topic we're unpacking today has deep connections to reconciliation and the integral role that Indigenous communities must play in local climate resilience partnerships. First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples across Turtle Island have been stewarding these lands since time immemorial and bring essential knowledge, strengths, and lived experiences to this, these issues. And I want to highlight two recent reports on Indigenous climate resilience. So the first is For Our Future, which dives into five key messages and supporting case studies of Indigenous-led climate adaptation initiatives. So the themes here are Indigenous people have unique strengths for responding to climate change. Climate change is one of the many challenges facing Indigenous communities. Indigenous knowledge systems and lived experience are essential. Food, water, and energy nexus is essential as well. And self-determination is critical. There's a second one I want to highlight, and that's lived experience and stories of extreme heat among Indigenous households in British Columbia by the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, which is uh, who is a climate community climate transitions member, a CCT member, doing leading work on integrating a climate resilience lens into asset management of Indigenous housing in BC. So you'll find those reports in the chat and um, I hope though you find those interesting. So I want to introduce the topic briefly and the speakers and sort of frame why we're having this conversation today. Unfortunately, this topic feels even timelier than we had imagined when we started planning this some months ago. So last week, Emergency Preparedness Minister Harjit Sajan warned that we can expect the wildfire season to start sooner, to end later, and to potentially be more explosive. Fire risk forecasts for the spring indicate an early and above normal fire risk across the country in April and May due to a warmer than normal winter with little snow and widespread drought. And in anticipation of another dangerous wildfire season, the BC government is already urging people to pre-register for emergency support now to avoid long wait times in cases they are forced from their homes. Here at Tamarack, those of you who know us in the room know that we believe in the power of local partnerships to tackle society's most wicked challenges and adapt to climate change. Adaptation to climate change and strengthening resilience is no exception. When municipalities collaborate with residents and community groups, along with a host of other partners like indigenous communities, health authorities, schools, businesses, and so on, they can respond more effectively to extreme weather events like fires, floods, heat waves, and droughts. So I'm pleased to be joined today by three practitioners who bring diverse perspectives to this topic from rural Ontario, sorry, from urban Ontario to rural BC, from a municipality and from community. They each bring unique stories and learnings from their local context. So Jim Cooperman is an author and environmentalist who lives in Lee Creek in the British Columbia interior region, where he writes on local area history, natural history, and conservation issues. He has been actively involved in the response to the BC wildfires last summer, both during and after the fires, and is working to improve future emergency response, including through activating residents and local knowledge and resources in a meaningful way. Ben Gallagher is the emergency manager for a city of Mississauga, Canada's seventh largest city, where he's worked since 2018. Ben holds a master's degree in public safety from Wilfrid Laurier University and an honors bachelor degree from York University. And Larissa Perrick is an emergency management specialist at the city of Mississauga. Before, after completing her master's degree, Larissa began her PhD journey in rural studies before transitioning to the city of Mississauga. Larissa's experience in community engagement, community leadership, and social capital 
has contributed to strengthening resilience and preparedness in Mississauga. So welcome to the three speakers today and welcome to everyone who's during this call. I see lots of participants here today. So over to uh, the speakers today and Jim, I'm gonna start with you out west. I'd love to hear just what happened last summer with the wildfires and what from your perspective went well and what didn't. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm speaking here from the traditional territory of the Sequetmic people. And uh, this map behind me is the map of our watershed. And so I'm a, a bioregionalist and I write about our region and I've been studying it and, and uh, learning more. I continue to learn every day. And our region, like many regions across the world, are now on the front lines of the climate chaos emergency war. And that was most evident here last summer. We have been worried, I have been worried very much about the possibility of a wildfire. And uh, uh, I've been working in our community for many years uh, on environmental issues, help, uh, help save parks here, and, um, and uh, re worked on reforming forestry practices. So I've been very well aware of the uh, dangers posed uh, because of the climate chaos we're in and um, and the possibility that we could be hit by a wildfire. And consequently, um, we took measures beginning a few years ago to fire smart our property. And uh, we have 40 acres and we logged, uh, uh, basically we took out 60% of the stems and left 40% here, um, uh, just the big biggest trees, the mother trees. And um, as a result, uh, our, we saved our home um, from the fire smart work we did. Uh, you don't want to have any conifers near your home if you live in a rural area or any junipers. So, but I do want also, this is a really a webinar focused on solutions and, and how communities can and residents can work together with municipalities and other levels of government, right? So I want to make sure we're really focused on these solutions. So. I want to turn to an example that I think is we're gonna find really positive coming from the city of Mississauga. There's been a really great collaboration there between the city and Climate Connect. And I'd love to hear uh, more from um, you about that, um, Ben and Larissa. Awesome, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna talk about something a little bit different. So I'll share my screen here just so you can see some photos. Um, to give a bit of context, so hopefully everyone can see the screen here, but um, yeah, thanks so much, Laura. Um, so as Laura mentioned, we work for the City of Mississauga's Office of Emergency Management, and we were able to connect with a local uh, group last year, Climate Crisis Connect, which was a youth-led in youth initiative that was founded by a University of Waterloo student named Maham with the goal of preparing marginalized youth in Mississauga for climate-related emergencies. And they've hosted a number of different events. And last year, they reached out to us to see if we could participate in their Are You Ready workshop aimed towards preparing BIPOC youth for climate emergencies. Uh, so we said, of course, we want to participate. And during that event, we were able to connect with around 20 BIPOC high school students living in Mississauga to provide a bit of information on the work that we do. But more importantly, to hear from them about the risks that they are most, con most concerned about concerned with um, or that they think are the most prominent and some of the challenges that they foresee with climate change related emergencies moving forward. So it was a really great experience. Um, and we were actually able to do a cool exercise with the students where they were able to map the different risks and vulnerabilities that they thought existed in Mississauga. Um, but I think it's important to highlight that we at the city really can't take any credit for any of this because it was all Maham who organized the entire thing, including developing the program, Moving the space, getting funding for things like food and giveaways, um, and even making sure that the students receive their high school volunteer hours for attending. So we really actually didn't have to do much except for show up on a Saturday, follow Maham's lead, and then listen to a bunch of very smart uh, and insightful high school students. And I think having Maham organize the event was way better than had we organized it ourselves. Um, because I remember being a high school student, and when I was a high school student, I think I would be much more engaged in something if it was 
organized by someone who looked like me, was around the same age as me, uh, and was from the neighborhood that I was from, as opposed to the miscellaneous government worker who, even though I'm only in my early 30s, let's face it, for a high school student, that's pretty old. And so I recognize that I'm not someone that is nearly as relatable to these students as someone like Maham is, or as relatable as whichever community members or leaders that our residents are most comfortable with. Um, and I think the lesson that we took away from this was that we as emergency managers tend to have a bit of a savior complex, which I think is a really positive thing because I think we all get into this field because we really want to help people. Um, but unfortunately, this trait can sometimes not always be for the best. And I think as emergency managers and probably as government workers generally, we tend to unconsciously put ourselves a level above the residents we serve. So not only do oftentimes we think that we're just a bit smarter and know just a bit more than the common resident, we think that they don't understand what's in their best interest or in the best interests of their communities and that we're better positioned as the emergency managers to make decisions about resilience in their communities for them. Um, so what we end up fairly doing at a fairly tacit level is view our community members as being kind of these utterly helpless victims that we need to come and save, but and we believe that we're the ones that should come and rescue them. And then while I think there is some a degree of subject matter expertise that we can use to help inform our community groups, it's obviously our local residents like Maham that understand their communities best and are really the drivers and decision makers of positive change and resilience at the local level in their communities. Um, so I think we need to recognize that we are not a level above the residents that we serve. And there are a ton of residents and community groups like Maham and Climate Crisis Connect who are super talented and driven to make their communities more resilient. Um, and the main way that we can help is through connecting with these local champions connecting them with local government and really being for those there for those residents and community groups when they ask us to be and to really listen to what they have to say. Um, so that's a bit of background on Climate Crisis Connect, but Larissa is also now here and responsible for overseeing our uh, Resilience Hub program in the city. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions, but I can pass it back to you, Laura, or Larissa to chat a bit more about that. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that from you, Larissa. Yeah, awesome. So Ben put that perfectly. Oh, let me just make sure. Oh, I froze. There we go. <laughs> so Ben put that perfectly. Um, really is, you know, that multi-stakeholder approach when we all come together and, and listen with empathy. Um, it, we can make such important and meaningful connections and partnerships and, and change and sustainable change within that. So um, really connecting with the communities is going to make us more resilient in the long run. Um, so I'm working on a project called Resilience Hubs. Um, and, you know, Ben went ahead before I started in the position and he had um, consultations with different municipalities to really ask, you know, how's your resilience hub doing? What are you doing? And, you know, how can we grow and, 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 and create a great resilience hub? If you're not familiar with what a resilience hub is, I kind of view it in two different definitions, part one and part two. That first part I like to think of is the physical, right? So it is traditionally understood as a community facing facility that's augmented to support uh, communities before, during, and after an emergency. So for example, in the community that we're working with, very much flood prone area. Um, so uh, a physical space could be something where uh, people can go to for resources and supplies um, and so forth and a place for safety. Uh, there's also that second, like a part two to the definition. And um, I think that is more the social fabric of these hubs. And although the physical component of resilience hubs is important, having a physical space is important, um, it's the social fabric that really is um, the most important component to resilience hubs. Um, they're more effective. These places, these physical hubs, these resilience hubs are more effective when they're combined with um, social bonds, these strong social bonds that exist in our communities. Um, so we're trying to go ahead. One of our pilot projects, we have the unique experience of it not having a community center. Um, and that poses a issue because uh, a community center or a physical resilience hub can act as a spot where people can not only go for resources, but also create these connections and, you know, supply these activities and create these social bonds in and around the community. Uh, and because we don't have that community center, we're really more focused on strengthening the community. Um, so some of the things that I'm working on now, I want to preface by this is very much in the beginning stages. We are in the pilot 
pilot project, beginning stages. Uh, I'm just grateful to kind of get started on this work. But right now, I'm just trying to connect with community members. I'm having organic conversations. I'm meeting with coffee, uh, learning more about the community itself, really just trying to get a, a um a wholesome, meaningful approach to understanding the community. Because like Ben said, at the end of the day, they are the experts. The community living, the residents in that area, they are the expert, not us. We have our expertise in different areas, um, specifically emergency management, uh, but they truly are the ones that know their community best. Um, and we look to them uh, to kind of have this multi-stakeholder approach and all of us coming together. Um, so in the future, we're hoping to continue those connections. We're hoping to do things like emergency preparedness workshops for people like um, our older citizens who are in the area who might struggle with um, emergency preparedness in terms of accessibility. Uh, we're looking at building a resilience hub network. So not only the community can be more connected, uh, but also we being more connected to them as well and having this meaningful exchange back and forth where we can connect and be connected if and when an emergency were to happen. Great, thank you. Such inspiring work happening in the city, and I really appreciate that. Um, you, how you just acknowledged, you know, the importance of the lived experience of residents on the ground, and I think that's a common thread that I see between the stories here in Shuswap region and in Mississauga, in terms of uh, what you're all bringing to this conversation. So a reminder to please put your questions in the Q and A box, um, and so I'm seeing some come in, in the chat, which is great, and there's a lot of good questions coming in. Um, I want to um, go back to you for a moment, Jim, and we're going to get to Q&A really soon. So I have some kind of rapid questions for you all. And, you know, you spoke a lot about what has not worked, um, what did not work last summer, and uh, curious if you've seen some strategies that have worked around resident collaboration with government and to plan or an, an, um, an evacuation or, uh, yeah, what uh, success stories might folks on the call learn from? Okay, uh, so uh, my turn then? Or, yeah, okay, well, I'll tell you what did work. And yeah. and and for those, the, bef before I get into that, bef uh, for those who might've been concerned about what I had to say about the BC Wildfire Service, I, I have no qualms at all with the firefighters. They, they uh, really risky, dangerous work they do. Um, we're very thankful for all the work they do. The problem is that the man management, especially the upper level management, that's where there's concerns. Now, uh, as far as what went, went right here last summer or uh, during the our wildfire was that the community collaboration was over the top. Um, people uh, in every small part of the community so that our community spread out alongside uh, uh, the north side of our lake. Um, and uh, within it, there's numerous communities. I live in Lee Creek, then there's Scotch Creek, there's Salista. And then even within each of those communities, there's smaller groups uh, of neighbors that are close, that have properties close. When the fire hit and the people that stayed behind, they all worked very closely together. Um, Often there would be one house where there were meals prepared and people uh, uh, got food out of freezers that were thawing and, and prepared food. Um, we had uh, neighbors from across the lake bringing in supplies by boat because the authorities were brought in the police and they were basically trying to stop anybody from driving on the roads. They were basically trying to starve us out of here because of the rules evacuation order, everybody's supposed to leave. You're only allowed to stay on your property. You're not allowed to put the fire out on your neighbor's property. But despite all those rules and all the police, people found a way to become, people were resilient and found a way to work together and fight these spot fires. There were thousands of spot fires after the firestorm. And if the people hadn't stayed behind and put them out, so many more homes would have been destroyed and businesses. Like in Scotch Creek, we have a provincial park. There was a major fi a spot fire right across the street from the park. And the locals worked for days putting out the fire before there was even any BC wildfire service around. And, and so um, as a result of that, we now have a saying in the Shushwap, Shushwap 
strong. And so people uh, basically, because they work so hard together, they they establish uh, closer linkages and and friendships that are ever lasting now. And our community is um, in many ways, even though so much of it has been destroyed, we lost 176 homes, 50 damage, thousands of hectares of forest, a major uh, provincial park uh, just about destroyed. Despite all, all the devastation, the community is stronger now than it was before. And, and so we'll be better able to deal with uh, any disasters in the future. Um, groups are putting pulling together. They're taking these courses. You have to have an S100 course to like legally fight a fire. And so they're doing that. They're establishing trailers with firefighting equipment. So they're getting prepared. And um, so uh, it, that's the, what good came out of the uh, uh, out of the experience. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for sharing. And um, that's obviously here at Tamarack. Again, those who know us know that this building a sense of community, a sense of connection among neighbors and, and people within a given place is so important to us and what we do and, and those in the network and including everyone on this call, I'm sure. So I'm keen to dive a little more into that and go back to um, Ben and or Larissa, if you want to speak to the, this question of the role of social capital, connectedness, belonging, and a sense of community, um, how do those play in and how can communities um, and residents become more self-reliant? Absolutely, happy to answer. I know Larissa and I are both looking at each other. Larissa, do you want to answer this one or do you want me to? Okay. Um, so yeah, I think like Larissa mentioned, our social capital is our biggest um, factor when it comes to resilience as a community. We are a tribe species. We depend on each other for um, just about everything. And um, there's a Buddhist uh, teaching that says I came into this world with nothing, which basically means everything I have, I can be appreciative of all the people that somewhere along the way provided me with the things that I have today. And I think we like to look at social capital as the most important part. And it's our communities that are going to be helping each other and the connections that we made for information sharing, resource sharing, um, and really having those different communities to lie on each other. Um, the challenging part is that it's not as easy as just telling people, well, go be more social, go have more social capital, go join a club. Um, and even the resilience hubs that we are trying to work on is really can only go so far. And so there's a lot of factors that go up in, that are involved in how do we actually develop connected communities in our built and social environments. And that's a whole probably web, other webinar on its own. Um, but I think one of the things that we've been successful at in the city of Mississauga is connecting to other city departments, whether that's active transportation or planning and building or culture or parks that have a role to play in connecting communities and building building communities where people have these social gathering places um, and being able to explain to them that their work also influences our work because emergencies are really just a highlight the underlying social vulnerabilities that exist in our day-to-day -day life. So I would say, yeah, in theory, social capital, very important. Yeah, anything you wanna add to that one, Larissa? Yeah, I think there was a question in there and I know I'm getting ahead, but I think it relates to what Ben says about, you know, how do you create trust between municipality and communities and how do we kind of strengthen that partnership? And I think, you know, one of the things that has been interesting is I come from a community background, you know, working for NGOs and um, I do have that academia background as well. And it's my first time really working within a municipality. So it's really interesting to see how we engage in projects and how we engage with our community. It's just kind of different with, um, I guess, with when you're coming from an NGO or coming from a community-based organization. But I think the the biggest thing is building trust and how do we do that? It, it takes time. It takes being a real person and putting your people centered approach before your project um, and before the agenda that you might have. Um, and I think that is 
more difficult to, I guess, say than to put in action when we're speaking to municipalities where agendas are important, deadlines are important. But at the end of the day, when we're connecting with communities, you know, we're people at the end of the day, you know, people focus before project focus, you know, has to be the end result or, or the main action we take to get the end result of sustainable uh, community resilience. Yeah, great. No, that's something that we're always thinking about uh, and, and working with members on is that piece of trust and and how that takes does take time. And um, yeah, it's all about relationships, right? And in many cases, friendships and forming that mutual understanding and building empathy. There's, uh, there's quite a few great questions coming in. So please do keep posting those. And there's one that's posed from Andrew that a few people have, um, have done a thumbs up for about that mapping exercise you mentioned and how that was structured um, then. So are there uh, other examples of lesson plans or approaches to guiding community sharing of the climate risks that members experience? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Thanks to the uh, to Andrew who asked the question. Um, so we structured that mapping exercise where we each had a map for the students that we were working with, and they mapped out where they thought the top risks in Mississauga were and where they thought the top hazards that they um, were most interested in were. And then we as a group kind of took it up and saw what were the differences between the students, as well as what we look at in the city of Mississauga. Um, and we also looked at that kind of asset mapping piece too, to say, where are your social networks and where are these different, not official, but unofficial resilience hubs in the communities. And the students were able to map out in their specific communities and within the city, what were they thought were some of the most risk, top risks were, and also what were some of those key pieces of resilience. And that's really good for us to know, to understand what's happening at the local level and what's actually happening in the community level, um, as well as being able to highlight to the students some of the risks we're looking at and certain vulnerabilities that these students were all maybe in their early tween, early to mid teens. Um, and so things that have taken place maybe before they were even born that put, could reoccur in their communities. And so it gave them a better understanding of the risks in their communities. Uh, but I'd say even more so, it gave us a better understanding of what youth uh, and especially the youth in this community were concerned with. Great, thanks. I'm keen to hear advice that you would all offer to either those in, we saw on the, in the initial poll, like it's about 45% each from local governments and from communities, community organizations. So what advice would you offer to folks in, in either of those sectors on how to form successful partnerships? And whoever wants to launch us off for this one, you go for it. I can go ahead since I, I already kind of mentioned my piece of advice. I jumped the gun a little bit. <laughs> um, but that piece of advice that I'd give, and I think it's kind of reflected more in the municipality context, um, is be people focused, not project focused. You know, the minute we start putting those deadlines uh, and preconceived notions of what projects should look like, um, we've just eliminated the community out of the equation. Um, and in order to have, like we've been talking about, you know, sustainable community resilience, the only way is through meaningful partnerships. Um, so, you know, we have to remember who we are. And I know this sounds, you know, very, <laughs> I know this sounds very whatever, but you know, you are a person, you are not your company. At the end of the day, the values that are close to you and who you are as a person should be reflective in your work. Um, and that should always be the main priority. Um, of course, we represent our business. Of course, you know, we represent um, city of Mississauga, let's say. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the most meaningful, you can't create a meaningful connection if you're not genuine in and of itself. So um, your agenda takes a back burn on the connections that you're making. And yeah, just like stick to your values and be the person. <laughs> so important. Yeah, bringing our whole selves into this work. There's uh, some love in the chat for that idea as well. I think Jim, maybe I'll go to you next. And and um, as in, in regards to uh, what, I, what would you like to me to talk about right now? Just if you have advice for either those in local government or those in community on how to form these successful partnerships. Oh, successful partnerships. Uh, well, um, within the community, that's been happening um, just basically naturally as a result of our experience. 
Uh, trying to work with our regional district has been very difficult. Um, they uh, realize that uh, our community is quite angry with these bureaucrats and the politicians, uh, other than our own politician. Uh, our own regional district director stayed behind in our community, and he was thus ostracized by the rest of the uh, his directors and so on because he defied the evacuation order. So he's one of our community heroes. Whereas uh, the regional district chose to just uh, follow the letter of the law uh, to the nth degree and uh, and and are still uh, refusing. The, what the community wants from the regional district is a thank you. I mean, ideally we want an apology, but that is pretty difficult to get from any level of government. Um, but uh, at least a thank you, which is like be an acknowledgement that uh, uh, these community members who stayed behind and saved countless structures uh, deserve some credit. And um, and that hasn't happened yet. Instead, what they did is they hired consultants that did a study and uh, and they prepared a report that was basically tried to whitewash everything that happened last summer. And um, uh, so we're, we're still at odds with each other. And I don't know what it's going to take to, to change that. Um, yeah. I, ideally, uh, uh, local governments need to be uh, um, more aware of what the people are actually going through on the ground and, and, and show more compassion and concern. And uh, if, if the rules don't make sense, then try to find ways to get around them. Uh, and rather than just uh, continue to uh, insist on enforcing rules and regulations that don't make any sense in an emergency. Um, when an emergency- Sounds like there was really a lack of trust uh, there. I mean, yeah, the exact opposite of what Larissa's saying, exactly. right? Like trust broke down, mit lack of communication, lack of knowing one another as people, right? And, and yeah, Look what happened in Katrina in New Orleans. I mean, this is a common problem. It's um, and and uh, uh, if we all had uh, people like Larissa and Ben working in government, we'd be way better off. But unfortunately, we don't. <laughs> and so um, and, and too often people that live in towns are the ones that are working in government, where it's the rural people that have to face these emergencies. And and they don't have a conception at all what it's like to live rurally. You know, it's it's like if you live in an apartment building, you don't have a clue what it's like to have to deal with a forest fire or, and, and deal with um, having to get supplies surreptitiously and uh, all the problems around evacuation and, and emergencies. My goodness. And, and the, you know, we're just going to see more of these with the with the climate chaos we're in. And, and now this summer ahead, that could be many more fires. Goodness sakes, we've got to get better at, at doing all these things and, and having communities uh, work cooperatively yeah. with local governments. Entirely. And I want to put a pin in that piece around the rural-urban divide. I want to see if we can come back to that after. But I want to turn to you, Ben, because building off this conversation around trust, and I'm seeing a question from David in the chat, um, in the Q&A, how do we create an environment where community members feel comfortable to approach government or authorities? And I want to ask you, like, how have you grappled with that as a city? And how have you created an environment where people do feel comfortable coming to you and where you're you're able to have these trusting relationships. Yeah, so I'd say our first strategy is to go to them, go to the places where they already are and into where they are already doing the great work that they're already doing. Um, and I really can't say it any better than Larissa did. I'm a very firm believer that there is a right person at a right time in history. And Larissa was the perfect person to take on our Resilience Hub uh, project. Um, but I think, like Larissa said, project charters, business cases are all great, but that's not how human interaction works. And that's not how um, we should be dealing with community members. So I think a big part of making sure we're building that trust is exactly what Larissa is doing right now, which is just building that trust, going out with no objective in mind other than to get to know these organizations, get to know what their challenges are, um, especially in our case, in the context of 
uh, emergency preparedness, um, but also just in general. And so make sure we're building those human connections. Um, and so I'd say a big piece of advice that I could give to anyone on the call is to just be open to those opportunities. Um, go out and meet, meeting out your community residents, even if you're not sure what information you're gonna get or what's gonna come from it, there doesn't need to be an immediate goal. And it's just, the goal should just be to get to know those community members and to help to build those trust. Um, because there is definitely that divide between local residents and their in government, um, especially in certain certain areas of our city. So I would say if you can hire a Larissa, please don't hire our Larissa because she's doing great work in Mississauga um, and we, we need her to keep doing that work. Okay, Ben. Uh, and I just want to build off of what Ben said here because I think the technical glitch didn't allow me to expand on resilience hubs. I won't go I won't re-explain, but, um, but very much, you know, the, the starting part for, you know, the resilience hubs quote unquote project, um, isn't just to create ideas and implement them to the community. Cause that's the opposite of what, <laughs> what we're trying to do. Um, really we want to learn, you know, what is not only the needs of the community, but also what are their strengths? What are their capacities? What are they doing well? Um, of course, being mindful of the risks and, and what's happening in there, uh, but also just understanding, you know, what are they doing well and what are their strengths and how can we help, um, how can we, you know, help to facilitate any change um, and the great work that they are doing uh, as the community leaders are, are within their communities doing what they do best. Um, and I just think it's really important to recognize that, you know, we are just simply the facilitators of this. And yeah, very much resilience hubs are connecting with the community, learning about them, and then building our project based on the relationships and information uh, and partnerships that we've created. I just wanted to clarify that because the technical glitch made me uh, skate through that. <laughs> no, love that. And if there's a resource you can share with folks on the resilience hub, that would be Really welcome. I'm not sure if we were able to find one online, but uh, yeah. And then I want to stay with you, for, Larissa, for a moment, because I want to come back to this rural urban piece, right? And there are so many differences between these two st stories we've um, gone into today, but I think there's also commonalities. And, you know, you were pursuing a um, PhD in rural studies and you have a background in that area and you're working in Mississauga now. So I'm curious how you see that, um, how can we kind of bridge those divides when it comes to community climate resilience? Yeah, um, let me start by saying I'm not in my PhD anymore, <laughs> uh, full time in this job. Um, and, you know, I, I trusted Ben and I trusted this department um, to, to kind of leave the PhD uh, and really kind of get my hands dirty with this. So just wanted to clarify. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I also come from a small town um, not up north, but more into the Muskoka area. Um, and then, you know, moving to the city, there are stark differences. We know that. Um, and especially, you know, doing my academia and focusing on rural and remote areas and then being hired in a municipality, a city of Mississauga, you know, one of the largest <laughs> cities. Um, it's, it's different. Of course, we can recognize the differences, but, um, I think at the end of the day, when, when I'm looking at, maybe the work that I've done, uh, the connections that I've made um, and the mentors that I've had along, along my academia process. Looking at cities, you know, we can start to look at them through their, the lens of the communities and through these smaller, um, these smaller points. And it, it's, we're all seeking the same thing to create a sense of safety and preparedness in the lens of emergency management, um, be more connected. I think especially when we're going through something like COVID, when we were craving the, the connectedness because we didn't have it, um, how do we continue that craving of social connection in a way that um, can expand our resilience um, and work together and, and kind of, yeah. So I don't think I'm explaining that as well as I want to. <laughs> Um, but yeah, lots of differences, but I think the similarities in terms of looking at these neighborhoods as these small, these communities, right? These connections, you know, when we look at it from so broad, yeah, it's so difficult to come up with quote unquote solutions or to come up with you know, some sort of action, you know, the way that we're starting these projects, uh, very much, you know, looking at the neighborhood and kind of seeping to these small communities and expanding from there. I don't think I reiterated that well, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah. 
No, that's great. I appreciate it. And um, you did a great job with that one. I would do either um, Ben or Jim have any thoughts on this one? Yeah, as someone who did not do their PhD in uh, rural studies like Larissa was doing, um, I'd say, yeah, there's there are vast differences between urban and rural communities, but I think those underlying social capital um, components remain. And I think there's an inherent level of social connection in our rural communities as well. Um, and I'm a big proponent of making sure that to preserve uh, the rural way of life is also dependent on how we develop our cities. Um, and so developing our cities in a way that fosters social capital also helps our rural communities maintain those social connections and that rural way of life, which is very important to their resilience. So not a ton to add. I think Larissa did great. Um, but yeah. Great. There are I a think couple. The yeah. Oh, sorry. I think Go the ahead. main thing that we have to really focus on at this point in, in, in where we're headed with climate chaos is basic survival. And and for rural communities and, and rural uh, municipalities surrounded by forests, uh, we've really got to do a better job at fire smarting around our communities. It's, it's critical. And, and just getting the dead wood out and the lower branches and the little trees doesn't cut it. When you have a firestorm, it doesn't matter if you've done that or not. A firestorm doesn't care if it the if it's if the forest has been fire smarted or, or not. It it'll just whip right through there. Uh, the only thing that you can do is to do some serious logging. Um, uh, Sixty percent is what we did here. Um, it, 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 that's I that's what I would recommend. And just leaving the biggest trees and 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 basically changing the forest structure from uh, from conifers to deciduous around communities, because then you're still, you know, s sucking up the carbon dioxide with the deciduous trees, and you're providing much more safety to the communities, and and that's uh, number one focus. And 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 for two, everybody that lives in a, a area that could be hit by a forest fire has got to get prepared and and have uh, sprinklers on their roofs and and be ready for the fire. Um, yeah. Some great words for us as we're coming to the close of the session and uh, thinking about the, the summer ahead and all the predictions there. Uh, there are, uh, we have time for a uh, super quick, if we could do like a rapid fire, either Ben or Larissa. There, there's a couple of questions in the chat around young people, what it was like working with them and whether you, um, saw a, a high climate anxiety or what maybe surprised or challenged you? If you have like one nugget on either of those. Yeah, absolutely. And like Clarissa mentioned, we're actually piloting um, our Resilience Hub program in our Cooksville neighborhood of Mississauga, which is a um, equity denied community and also a community that's experienced firsthand climate change um, impact. So a lot of these students we were talking to have experienced extreme heat, have experienced flooding, have experienced severe winter storms firsthand. Um, and so they're the ones that are seeing the uh, firsthand effects of climate change. So um, I think our youth have a lot of experience already with climate change. Um, and so there's no wonder that this is something that would be of the top of their concerns. Um, and so being able to connect with them on that and hear from that uh, was a really powerful experience. Great, well, I, I wish we had more time to continue, but we're at just about the top of the hour. So I just really want to thank you all, Larissa, Ben, Jim, for taking the time to be part of this conversation, for sharing all the insights and experience and, and the raw emotions, again, that really come with, uh, with, with this, with the, the climate crisis we're all living through. It's not easy. And I appreciate everyone's the respect um, that we've had in the room today for, I would say, divergent views. There's been, <laughs> been so different perspectives and views shared, but I really want to thank everyone in the room for joining us and participating and helping make this a lively conversation and all your great questions. There's a survey that um, is gonna be added in the chat in a moment for feedback. And Jamie has also shared upcoming webinars. So we hope to see you again at an upcoming Tamarack webinar and please do share feedback on today's session so that we can um, improve them going forward. So thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day.